Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, LIT seminar. It's our distinct pleasure to have uh, Nihar Shah uh, as our speaker today. Um, Nihar is a professor in machine learning and computer science at Carnegie Mellon. His research interests span statistics, machine learning, information theory, and game theory. Uh, recently, he has been focusing on uh, how to improve peer review process uh, through computational methods. Um, his work has flavor of both mathematical guarantees and analysis, as well as experimental evaluation and deployment. Uh, he has uh, received numerous awards, a uh, few being uh, Google Scholar, Research Scholar, uh, NSF Carrier, um, and Sacrison Memorial Prize. Um, he's got Microsoft PhD Fellowship early on when he was a grad student, got uh, quite a few best paper awards, including the IEEE data storage, as well as for a couple of years, and the best paper award at uh, AAMAS in 2019. So with that, uh, Nihar, floor is yours, and looking forward to hearing the two F words in the peer review. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much for the kind introduction um, and for hosting me. Um, so my group uh, works on uh, addressing problems in peer review from principled and practical approaches. And in this context today, I'm going to talk about two F words in peer review. Um, so throughout the talk, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. So peer review uh, is extensively used in the review of scientific papers. And this is something which many of you might have already experienced. Uh, it's also used to award billions of dollars worth grant proposals. It's used extensively in the industry for evaluation and promotions of people. And due to the extensive use of peer review, any problems in peer review can have significant consequences. For example, problems in peer review can hurt scientific progress. Uh, in academia, it's well known that there is this rich gets richer effect due to which problems in peer review can hamper even the careers of uh, uh, researchers. And problems in peer review also considerably negatively affect the public perception of science. So due to these reasons, it is very important to address any challenges in peer review. And today I'm going to talk about two challenges which are represented by these two F words, fraud and feedback. So this also forms the outline of the talk. I'll first talk about fraud and then feedback. And throughout the talk, please feel free to just unmute yourself if you have any questions and ask. Or if you have questions, you can also type in the chat. I have another machine here where I'm monitoring the chat. So with that, let me start with issues of fraud. And this is joint work with my PhD student, Steven Jackman, as well as with Han Rui Zhang, Ryan Liu, Fei Feng, and Vince Konitzer. So in recent years, there has been a particular type of fraud that has been uncovered. Here, a reviewer and an author make a pact. The reviewer tries to get assigned the author's paper and then push for acceptance of this colluding author's paper. In return, the colluding author returns the favor either by doing the same thing in that context Else and this was uh, perhaps first uncovered in the computer architecture community quite recently, where there was a thorough investigation which found these kinds of collusions. And uh, this investigation uh, was prompted by some quite dire and unfortunate consequences. Um, and overall, this investigation concluded that our process is not set up to combat such collusion. Now, these collusions have also been uncovered in conferences in other research areas, including ML and AI, as well as in grant proposal reviews. So one key aspect of these collusions is that the colluding reviewer tries to get assigned the target paper. 
And to understand this further, let's look at some background. So here is how the assignment of reviewers to papers is done in most large conferences. This assignment is automated and takes place in two phases. In the first phase, you compute what are called similarities. So for every paper and reviewer pair, let's say paper P and reviewer R, a similarity score is computed. So let's call this SPR. This is a number in zero to one. And a higher similarity score means that you envisage a better quality of review by this reviewer for this paper. Now this similarity score is computed based on various kinds of data. For example, natural language processing techniques are used to match the text of the submitted paper with the text of the reviewer's past papers. Moreover, in many conferences, reviewers and authors are asked to provide subject areas or keywords, and these are matched. And then this also includes what are called reviewer bits, and we'll revisit reviewer bits in a few slides from now. Nihar? Yes. yes. Uh, potentially a tangential question, but in, uh, in these conferences are the history of reviewers uh, reviews in the past is also included or not yet? Yeah, good question. Um, not yet. So in many of these conferences, there are strict guidelines as to what can be passed from one conference to another. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, these are usually not used. Um, ideally, they should, uh, but not yet. Okay. Great. Um, if there are any other questions, please, please feel free to interrupt. All right. So um, the similarity score um, as a special case is set to minus infinity if you know that uh, the paper P and reviewer R have a conflict. For example, if an author of this paper itself is this reviewer R or is a colleague or close collaborator of the reviewer, then the similarity is set to minus infinity. Right? Now, once these similarities are computed, you move on to the second phase of the assignment where these scores are used to assign the reviewers to papers. And here is how it is done very widely. So the assignment is done by simply solving this optimization problem on the screen. The variable for this optimization problem is the assignment. And the objective sums over all papers and reviewers, and then has the similarity SPR along with the indicator that paper P is assigned to reviewer R. So in plain words, this is trying to find the assignment so that the sum of the similarities of the assigned paper reviewers pairs is as large as possible. Now you find this assignment subject to some, some load constraints. That is every paper should get say a certain number of reviewers and no reviewer should get more than a certain number of papers. Mm -hmm. uh, questions, anyone? Feel free to ask. All right, so with this background, now let's see some possible defenses against such colluding behavior. The first line of defense is to use conflicts of interest. If you know that a certain author and reviewer are collaborators or colleagues, don't assign these papers. And this so, is already done. Yes, question. So, sorry to interrupt. And uh, maybe you're going to explain this in a second. But given this process so far, I as a, let's say, a reviewer, and let's say you as a paper or author, while you and I have exchanged information that you have submitted paper X, and I want to sort of actually review your paper X, so far, um, what is the mechanism that allows me to sort of, let's say, make myself more likely to be assigned? Yes. Very good. So we are going to discuss this in a little more detail, but um, so I, there are these three bullets in the based on, yeah. right? and all three can be gamed. So when you say reviewers past papers, the reviewer has to create a profile. I see. Got it. And the reviewer can create profiles. Then the subject areas and keywords are chosen by authors and reviewers. 
Yes. And then finally, the bids are also made by reviewers. Sure. Perfect. So in principle, I could just bid only the, the there's a bigger group. I could just bid on only on the papers that sort of match it. Got it. Perfect. 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 Thanks. Great. Other questions, so, please ask. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Right. So when you say collaborators, do they identify that just based on whether they have co-authored a paper in the past or are there other? Yeah, so there are a few ways. Um, the most common way is what you said. That is, you look at the co-authors in past papers. There are some other venues which ask you that, hey, are there any other conflicts of interest? And then you're supposed to provide them. For example, if it's a current collaboration, um, et cetera. Um, so if somebody is colluding, maybe we cannot expect them to voluntarily give this information. And so in that case, it will just be based on past co-authorships. Great, other questions? Please, please feel free to ask. All right, so this is already done, but the challenge is, is that the colluders may not be collaborators, known collaborators or colleagues. In fact, uh, this investigation in the computer architecture community had found that these colluders actively try to skirt conflicts of interest detectors. So they found that there was a chat group of a few dozen authors who worked on common topics, but they were very careful to not co-author with each other. And even if they collaborated, they voluntarily gave up authorship just so that they don't appear in each other's conflicts of interest lists. Yeah. All right. So now what can we do beyond this defense? The next line of defense um, considers that this quid pro quo would happen in the same conference. So I help your paper and you help my paper in the same conference. And then the defense tries to detect or remove cycles or rings in the bidding or in the assignment. For example, it says that if I am assigned your paper, then you will not be assigned my paper. The obvious challenge here is that while a reviewer may target an author's papers in this conference, the author might reciprocate elsewhere in a different conference or in a grant proposal review or somewhere else. In that case, this method won't work. The third line of defense looks at bids. So what are bids? So initially, when all of the papers are submitted at the deadline, all the reviewers are shown the list of submitted papers. And then the reviewers can select which papers they are willing or not willing to review. So this is typically done in most uh, conferences. But now um, our work has shown and so has some subsequent work that via strategically bidding, a reviewer can significantly increase the chances of getting assigned a target paper. And so with this observation in mind, there's a nice subsequent work which looks at issues in bidding. And at a very high level, the, the main idea behind this work is to remove bits which are outliers with respect to other similarities and bits. So while one might focus on bits, there are some challenges. The first challenge is that the other aspects of these automated systems, like choosing the subject areas or choosing the reviewer profiles, all of these can be gamed. Right, and this is quite well known. Second, there are these very, very interesting PDF embedding attacks on the text matching systems. So I'm happy to chat more about these offline, uh, but if you're interested, I'm happy to also provide references. These are very interesting papers on these attacks. And finally, the colluding reviewer may already have expertise for that paper, and so might be assigned even without you know, gaming bids, et cetera. Mm. So now, um, given all of these challenges, our approach is slightly different. Our approach is a mitigating strategy. So we want to mitigate these kinds of collusions 
by imparting some sort of diversity in the review or assignment by means of randomness or constraints. So this is what we are looking to do at a higher level. Towards this, we have a bunch of results um, of various constraints, et cetera, which yield various levels of uh, mitigation. Um, some of these results are more involved and some are less involved. I'll not have time to go into all of them. What I'll discuss here is this one set of results. And the reason, reason I'm choosing this set is because this is quite a simple set of results. So for this audience, which I envisage is quite broad, I'll be able to present an algorithm and some hand wavy proofs. And this has also been quite impactful. So this is already implemented in a very popular uh, conference management system and has been used in several venues. So recall initially we discussed that a key aspect of this collusion is that a reviewer is trying to get assigned a target colluding paper. So what if we break that link? One way to break that link is, let's just assign reviewers to papers uniformly at random. In that case, no matter what the reviewer does, the chances of getting assigned their target colluding paper is very small. But of course, there's a problem, right? The assigned reviewers may not have expertise. So what we do is instead, we'll impart some randomness still in the assignment, but in a controlled fashion, and we'll trade off optimally between randomness and expertise. That's the basic idea. So here's the more formal formulation. The program chairs will specify a matrix, which we call Q. So the matrix Q has papers as rows, reviewers as columns, and every entry in the, is in the interval zero to one. And given this matrix Q, what we want is that the probability with which any reviewer R is assigned to any paper P is at most QPR. That is the PRth entry of Q. So this is how we are imparting randomness. That is, we are saying that no matter what reviewer R does in terms of getting assigned paper P, the probability with which this reviewer will be assigned to this paper is bounded. So it yeah. isn't, this is, Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So, so this is the control basically. Yes. And then sort of you would you would tell us how, how to think about uh, design choosing this control. Yeah, so we will come to that, yes. Great. And please, please feel free to interrupt everyone if you have questions. So now you could choose Q as a constant matrix and you could do that trading off the expertise with the randomness, and we'll discuss this in more detail later. Also, in case you have some other, as the program chairs, if you have some other information or some requirements about these collusions, you can choose Q based on that. And given this matrix Q, our goal is that we want to choose an assignment. This will be a random assignment. And we want to do this not only in polynomial time, but in practical time. By practical time, I mean that if you go to large conferences like MUREPS or AAAI, you should be able to execute this algorithm in let's say 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Yeah. You want to get this assignment so that it meets these Q probability constraints that are written above. And subject to that, we want the best possible objective value that is the sum similarity value and expectation. That's the goal. So in a sense, going back to your yeah. earlier one yeah. where so you want to maximize similarity. Uh, uh, so you want to choose an assignment subject to sort of the constraints on number of papers assigned to reviewer, number of reviewers assigned to a paper, and yes. then sort of in addition to this. That's correct. Okay. And the objective now will have an expectation because the assignment is now random. Perfect. 
All right, so here is how we would go about this. So in the first step, instead of choosing an assignment, which is binary, right? The actual assignment will be such that either you assign a paper to a reviewer or you don't assign the paper to the reviewer. We first choose a fractional assignment, meaning that you might fractionally assign a reviewer to a paper. Mm -hmm. So the objective here is the same as before, just that now this F, which is this variable can be real value. The constraints are the same except for the last constraint, which says that FPR is at most QPR. So in this way, we first compute a fractional assignment. And now the way we use it is that the value FPR will be the probability with which the paper P will be assigned to reviewer R. Okay. So given this fractional assignment, we'll sample an assignment at random so that in the realized assignment, the load constraints are met and the sampling meets all of these probability constraints. That is the probability with which any reviewer R is assigned to paper P is exactly FPR. Okay. Any questions? This is, uh, sorry, I'm trying to sort of uh, get my, so this is like B matching basically. Uh, yeah, um, so B matching, well, if I understand the terminology correctly would be the deterministic one itself. Deterministic one. And so in some sense, this is random one and you are going to put a distribution on such uh, B matching because at the end of the day, your final answer would be something, one of them. That's correct. Yes. Got it. Got yes. It. Perfect. Got it. All right. Wait, other questions? Please, please feel free to ask. Feel free to type on chat or unmute yourself. All right. So now from this, some guarantees follow quite easily, given this steps one and two that we've written down. Um, first, this meets the Q constraints. Why? Because FPR is at most QPR, and F is the probability with which a reviewer R is assigned to paper P. Second, this gives you the optimal assignment in expectation. So the FPRs are just the probabilities so if you look at the objective, it's maximizing the assignment quality in expectation. And F is the expectation of the indicator. And finally, um, this is more involved to prove, but this is polynomial time and in fact, practical time. And we'll discuss algorithms for this in a minute. Okay. All right, so now how do we actually do steps one and two? So let's do an example. I won't present this in full generality, but let's say that this value QPR is chosen to be a half for all paper reviewer pairs. So Q is a constant matrix with values 0.5. Let's say that the number of papers equals the number of reviewers. And let's say that all loads are one. So each paper has one reviewer, each reviewer has one paper. Yes, there's a question. Uh, how do you sample an assignment in the end? Uh, is FPR the accurate marginal for sampling matchings? Yes, I'll talk about this. So FPR is indeed the accurate marginal for sampling. And I'll run through uh, the actual sampling algorithm for this example. Okay. And our general sampling algorithm is a generalization of what I'll present. Okay. Thank you and everyone, please ask, keep asking questions. All right, um, so let's do this example. So first we'll compute um, this fractional matching F and towards this notice that in the constraints I've set the loads to one. And then since our Q matrix was a constant matrix of 0.5, the final constraint says that FPR is at most 0.5. Okay, this is just the FPR less than or equal to QPR constraint. Now, this is a nice linear program, which you can solve in polynomial time. And, and in practice, this is very fast. And in particular, this structure yields one really cute property. And it's cute enough that I can actually prove it uh, on the slide. So the claim is 
that there is an optimal such that the FPR values are either zero or a half for all PR. Why is this true? Let's actually do a proof. So let's do a change of variables. Let's say that F tilde is twice of F. So with this, let's substitute F tilde equals two F in the program on the left. So we changed everything from F to F tilde and we get this. And now it's not hard to show that this optimization problem satisfies TUM conditions. Yeah. TUM conditions simply imply that you can get an optimal solution which is integral, which is integer valued. And so you get integer valued F tilde. And that's nice because F is F tilde divided by two. That was the first line of the proof. So F tilde is either zero or one. And hence F, which is F tilde divided by two is either zero or a half. Right, any questions? So in this case, you will need some, it's just sorry, thinking aloud, a number of papers and number of reviewers should be equal, right, in this case? Yes, so, so we simplified for this particular example, we simplified it to number of papers being equal to number of no, reviewers. No, sorry, in the sorry my bad, I, I, I didn't yeah. catch it. I'm yeah, that's no problem. So are more general results, like they more hold more generally. That's for just this example. Hey, great point, thank you. Any other questions? All right. So now we got this F and it has this nice property that every FPR is either a zero or a half. So now we come to this sampling step. So we want to sample an assignment so that F is exactly the marginal and the loads in this sample assignment are a one. Now, for those who are familiar with the Birkhoff von Neumann decomposition, that this might seem reminiscent of the Birkhoff von Neumann decomposition. Um, although this sampling doesn't really follow from that. Uh, what we do build on is this very nice algorithm by Bhutesh et al. So we, our algorithm builds on that and also offer simplifications to their algorithm. So for this example that we have been looking at, let's see how we can sample this assignment. So let's construct a bipartite graph. One set of the graph is, one set of nodes is the reviewers and one set is the papers. Now the edges here represent the support of F. That is, there is an edge between a paper and a reviewer if that value of FPR is 0.5 and there is no edge if FPR was zero. So this is how we first construct this bipartite graph. Now notice that this is a two regular graph. Why is that? Consider any node, let's say a reviewer node, and you know that the FPR values from that reviewer node to all papers can be either zero or a half. But you also know that the load on this reviewer is a one, meaning that the sum of the FPRs is one. Since FPR is either zero or a half, there must be exactly two FPRs which are a half and rest are zero. So hence, the degree of every node is two. And this is nice because this tells us that the edges can be written as a union of disjoint cycles. So let's color them as a union of disjoint cycles. So we have a blue cycle, red and a green cycle. Now let's do the sampling. So consider any individual cycle, let's say this blue cycle. Let's traverse this cycle and partition alternating edges as dashed, dotted, dashed, dotted, dashed, dotted. Now flip a coin with probability half, we take the dashed edges and use that in the final assignment and discard the dotted edges. Or otherwise, we take the dotted edges and use that in the final assignment. Then take the next cycle, 
again split alternating edges as dotted dashed and so on then with probability half pick the dashed edges or with probability half the dotted edges likewise for each cycle you do the same thing and this is the sampling algorithm so now you can see that this satisfies the marginal probabilities of 0.5 for the support every edge was classified either as a dashed or a dotted edge and it had a 50% chance of being chosen in the final assignment moreover all of the degrees are one every node had a degree 2 but one of those edges was classified as dotted one of them was dashed and we picked only one of the two so this also respects the load constraints right so this is the sampling algorithm for this example of q equals 0.5 And then our more general sampling algorithm generalizes this. Okay. Any questions? So, yeah, this is very nice. So one question is, um, and maybe sort of uh, uh, this is an ill-posed question, and hence, but let me ask it. Yeah, yeah. Um, since you had a linear program and you have um, uh, a solution uh, at the end of the day. Um, you will write it as a sort of somehow convex combination of these assignments and if i had if you had that convex combination of the assignments then you could simply use the weights of the convex combinations to choose them yes and you're not doing that uh, for a reason or maybe implicitly this is exactly what that is doing yes so implicitly this is exactly what this is doing however we are not writing them down explicitly one reason is that if if you look at this current example yeah let's say there are in general there might be n such disjoint cycles sure so now the support of that convex combination might be exponential in n um and if you were to actually list that entire support then you know you, you might run into computational and storage issues so i guess this goes back to that i remember some result from 80s one of those uh uh the loa shaver stuff where uh mm, okay i'll i'll remember there's an interesting reference basically there's okay. a nice condition under which when can you write down a point as a convex combination of uh, extreme points perfect uh, efficiently yeah so this, this is very perfect. nice because Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, and I'll really look forward to this reference. Thank you so much. Yeah. But implicitly, this is doing that. Um, all right. Um, so now, what about expertise? Right. We imparted randomness by using this Q thing. But remember, our, we started out by saying that we want to trade off randomness and expertise. So now, what value of Q should you choose? Mm. So this plot uh, tries to help answer that. Uh, this plot is based on data from iClear 2018 the x axis assumes that q is a constant matrix and the x axis plots that constant value okay, so this is the q value it's a constant matrix with the value as the x axis now for every q we compute this random assignment and the point on the y axis the y axis shows the sum similarity as a percentage of the deterministic assignment the one without randomness note that the realization the sum similarity of the realized assignment is very close to the expectation so there's very very little variance and so the error bars are not visible right so just as a sanity check q equals 0.1 means that we are not imposing any probability constraints and so q equals 0.1 reduces to deterministic and hence the y axis value when q equals 0.1 is at 100% you mean 1.0 q sorry q is 1 1.0 sorry thank you uh, q is 1 is deterministic and so the top right is at 100% i i know that you were you were checking that we were paying attention or not <laughs> Uh, i can make that joke <laughs> all right um so now as you go to the left you are decreasing q and hence you are imparting more and more randomness 
And once you're imparting more and more randomness, this is more constraints. Therefore, the sum similarity goes down. And this is the trade-off between the expertise and randomness. So in practice, the program chairs, if they want to choose a constant Q, right, they can generate such a plot. And then they can decide the point at which they want to operate. For example, here, if you choose Q as 0.5, meaning that every reviewer has at best a 50% chance of getting a paper, then you see that the sum similarity is 90% of the original. Yeah. Um, so this is how you could trade off. Yes. Sorry, yeah, sir. Yeah, uh, so uh, how do I, so, um, so maybe this is coming up in your next slide. And so pardon me if I'm uh, preempting, but sure. What does 0.5 mean? Because at the end of the day, the goal for me was to have Q to reduce some kind of um, collusion. Yes. So um, that means that somehow Q being, let's say 0.1 leads to some amount of collusion guarantee versus 0.5. And how do I sort of think about yeah. that? Yeah, so there are various ways of thinking about them. One of them is as follows. So let's say that uh, you have three reviewers for every paper and let's say that there is a target paper for which there might be three colluding reviewers. So you don't know who they are, but they're trying their best to get assigned this paper. So now you want to have a, at least a certain probability that an independent reviewer will be assigned to this paper. And so you can choose Q. So in this case, Q equals 0.5. You can show also guarantees that there is at least a seven over eight chance that an independent reviewer is assigned to this paper. I see. I see. So you, like this would be effectively my upper bound of saying that sort of what is the worst case that sort of, okay, understood. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Other questions, please, please ask. Um, so this was for iClear 2018. Um, in fact, uh, this, this particular algorithm was used in uh, AAAI 2022 where in fact the trade-off curve was better. So it was higher than this. And there the Q value was chosen to be 0.52. Okay. All right, so this uh, algorithm is now implemented in uh, openreview.net. So if you are organizing a conference or a workshop and using open review, you can ask them if, if you want to use this, you can ask them to enable this randomized assignments and they can do it for you. Um, if you're using Microsoft CMT, we have scripts for CMT as well. So I'm, I'm happy to provide them to you. And this has already been used at several venues. So there are various open problems in this direction of fraud. Is there, yeah. Sorry, is, is, there, is, yeah. is there hope to use this in hot CRP? Hot crap. Um, so I've, I've tried to speak with Eddie Kohler uh, and okay. he's busy, um, but uh, um, no, like if, um, it, it depends on how you are doing this, right? Like many program chairs, they'll download the data, run scripts on their machine and then upload it. Yeah. If you folks, if, if someone is doing that, then we are happy to provide scripts that interface. Okay, thank you. So uh, there are a number of open problems in this direction. We discussed one kind of fraud, but there are various other kinds of uh, dishonest behavior in peer review and mitigating them, um, addressing them is important. Um, there's also this line on detecting fraud. So we looked at mitigation and there's also just detection. These are nice statistical problems um, of practical value. There are also really important questions regarding policy, law and ethics here. So for example, should we allow algorithms to flag potentially fraudulent behavior? And if so, should a human be able to see it? Or should we just make it such that the assignment algorithm disables these potentially fraudulent bids or assignments? Moreover, if you find some suspicious reviews or if you find some actual fraud, what to do about it? Right? Should the names of these people be public or not and so on? There's a lot of debate. Currently many conferences, the only penalty is rejecting this particular paper, that's it. No names are ever out. You cannot keep any record of the names, et cetera. 
So yeah, there are these very interesting questions which are widely debated. So at this point, I'm done with this part on fraud. Uh, before I move on to feedback, I'm very happy to answer more questions. Folks, feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions. I guess we had 20 second Zoom pause, so maybe we can move on. <laughs> All right, awesome. So let me move on to the second part, which is about feedback. And this is a uh, joint work with my recently graduated PhD student, Jingyan Wang, my soon to graduate PhD student, Ivan Stelmark, and with Yu Ting Wei. So you know, if somebody, if let's say your friend had submitted a paper to a conference and the results come out and you ask them, hey, how was the review process? You're likely to get an answer depending on whether their paper was accepted or rejected. <laughs> and uh, now this is an issue of feedback that we'll discuss now. So for any system that you might develop and deploy, You'll do research and development and testing, and then you'll deploy. But then in the real world, you'll want to keep knowing how, uh, how this uh, works with the users, with the users' perceptions. You want to get feedback from the reviewers. And in peer review, one might argue that this feedback loop is, has a big question mark. Now, it has been suggested again and again that one way of getting feedback is to ask authors. You can ask authors to evaluate the peer review process in that conference or the specific reviews. The argument that is often made is that the authors know their papers best. So the author will know if the reviewer has been able to read the paper carefully or not, et cetera, et cetera. However, as we just discussed, the authors are known to be highly biased by the outcomes, the decisions on their own papers. And there are various studies um, that actually find this. Um, these find that the satisfaction of the author with the reviews had a strong and positive association with the acceptance of the manuscript, but not really with the quality of uh, this quality of the review. Now, so our goal is to de-bias this author provided feedback. And there's a similar problem in teaching evaluations. So you know, in, in courses that are taught, at the end of the course, the students are asked to rate the instructors and the course. And it's very well known that these ratings are highly biased by grading leniencies. There are a number of studies which evaluate that if the teacher is giving more A's, then they'll get more positive evaluations. That's why on the day of, day of grading, you take donuts to the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's another <laughs> confounder here, I guess, donut <laughs> confounder. Um, yeah. Uh, Great. So you know, people find that they have found that there are very strong um, causal associations from the evaluations, from the leniency to the evaluations. And this also introduces incentives for teachers to inflate grades um, or to get donuts. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we also want to address such a problem. So towards this, uh, here's our formal problem formulation. So we have a set of items to be evaluated. For example, these could be reviewers or courses or the review process itself. And every item, let's say item I, has some unknown true quality. So this is a scalar, which we'll call X star I. And this is what we want to find out. Now, for every item, you have a set of evaluators. These evaluators could be students in the courses or authors for the peer review case. Now here's our model. So if an evaluator J rates an item I, then we let YIJ denote the given rating. And we assume YIJ 
is a sum of the true quality x star i and then a bias term and a noise term. For the noise, we just assume this is an IID zero mean Gaussian, but this has an unknown variance and this creates challenges in our analysis. So unknown variance. A key focus on our problem formulation is this bias part. And I'll discuss this in more detail. So towards this, let's consider this peer review setting. And let's say these are the authors. Now what I've written down is the number of papers accepted and number of papers rejected for each author. For a moment, let's focus on the two authors on the left the ones in the circles. Now you can see that the left author, leftmost author is doing strictly better than the top left author. Two accepts zero rejects versus two accepts one reject. And so in our model, we assume this direction of bias. That is the leftmost author is at least as positively biased as the top left author and so on. Likewise, in the case of courses, let's say these are the students and these are the scores they have received. We assume that this determines the directionality of bias. So the first student who has received the highest score is at least as positively biased as the next student and so on. Importantly, in this case, in peer review, the program chairs know the outcomes of everybody's papers. So they know for each person how many papers were accepted or rejected. In the case of courses, the university also knows the scores of every student. And so we assume that the biases follow a certain partial ordering across the evaluators. And this partial ordering is known to us. Any questions? So, um, so biases have a known partial order and what would in this model represent Y's? Yes. Um, so the Y is just the evaluation that Got we it. give, for example. It. So it will be a separate number and then sort of bias is sort of based on something else, which is sort of, okay, got it. Yes, perfect. So the bias is based on, in the courses case, the bias is based on the scores they receive. And then this plus noise and the true quality determines the final evaluation YIJ that the student will get. Please feel free to ask questions, everyone. All right. So more formally, we model the biases in the following fashion. So we gen the biases BIJs are assumed to be generated IID zero mean Gaussian with an unknown variance and then permuted to align with the partial order. So this is the model. And note that again, the biases also have an unknown variance. The noise also had an unknown variance and this creates various challenges. Um, sorry, and, and the goal is to estimate the X's, X stars, and we consider the mean squared error okay, as, as the loss. So here's our proposed estimator. The estimator, let's call it x hat, is associated to a hyperparameter lambda. And the reason we need this hyperparameter lambda is because both the bias and the noise have unknown variances. So we don't know whether the, there is a high bias, low noise, or low bias, high noise. We don't know, and hence we need this hyperparameter. So we'll see how to choose lambda in a minute, but let's fix lambda for now. Then the estimator chooses the minimizer over X and then minimizer over BIJs, bias term, such that BIJs obey the partial ordering. And it considers the objective shown on the slide. What's this objective? The first term in this objective, recall that YIJ was equal to X star plus bias, plus noise. And so Y minus X minus B is just the noise. That's the first part of the objective. The second part is just the bias. 
So what they're trying to do here is they're trying to find the X which best fits the data in terms of the smallest noise and bias. Okay. And these two terms are traded off with this hyperparameter lambda. So this is the proposed estimator. And for this estimator, suppose you can choose lambda carefully, then some nice things happen. So if there is no noise, and if you can choose lambda equals zero, so this is not with cross-validation or anything, you're fixing lambda equal to zero, then you can show that this estimator is consistent. Whereas note that standard estimators like the sample mean are not consistent. On the other hand, when there's no bias, our estimator, if you set lambda as infinity, then in this limit of lambda being infinity reduces to something very nice. It reduces to just the sample mean. Right? So if there's no bias, there's only noise, then we know that the sample mean is minimax optimal. So this estimator reduces to that. Okay. So if you can set lambda, then in the two extremal cases of no noise or no bias, this is doing well. A key challenge here is how do we choose this lambda? Because we don't know the amount of bias versus noise. So standard way to choose this is cross-validation. But in trying to do a cross-validation, we are hit with a challenge which was uh, quite challenging. Um, <laughs> so let's see the standard way of choosing such a hyperparameter lambda. So we'll take all of our observed data and we'll partition it into a training set and a validation set. Right? This is how we do cross-validation. Then for every value of lambda in some set, we'll go to the training set and using the algorithm we have, we'll estimate x hat and b hat. And then we'll take that x hat and b hat, we'll go to the validation set and plug it in. And then on the validation set, we'll compute the validation error. And then finally, we'll choose the lambda which had the smallest validation error. Okay. So this is the standard way of doing cross-validation to choose the hyperparameter. But yes. But since you're an IJ, and train and test may be different, you don't have Bs available, right? Perfect. So what goes wrong? Exactly what Devrat said. <laughs> right, perfect. So this was a major challenge that the training set gives certain set of Bs, but those don't carry over to the validation set. They are a different set of Bs, so you can't use it as is. And this was a major headache. And the key idea was to use the knowledge of partial ordering Mm -hmm. to carefully interpolate the Bs on the training set to get Bs on the validation set. And as you might know, cross-validation itself is a headache to analyze. And this made it much, much more challenging. Um, so I'm almost out of time. I, this, there are just a couple more slides. So what we can show is that under extremal conditions, nice things happen. When there's no noise, this cross-validation estimator, it chooses lambda as zero. And when there's no bias, it chooses lambda as infinity. Right? So in these extremal conditions, it does the right thing. And we already know that when you do the right thing, that good things have happened in the previous slide, right? So these are our theoretical results. And uh, so our cross-validation recovers the extremal cases. And I won't go into the experiment due to lack of time, but we have done some semi-synthetic experiments where our estimator does quite well um, in terms of both the mean squared error, as well as we have investigated uh, the choices of lambda and it, you know, it makes really nice choices of lambda um, surprisingly well. Um, so I'm happy to chat about this offline, but let me wrap up. So there are a number of open problems in this feedback directions. 
One is for this problem, um, we have some consistency guarantees or limiting guarantees in the extremal cases. And it's open to design estimators with stronger sample complexity guarantees and those for non-extremal points. Moreover, this was a first crack at this problem and our model is admittedly somewhat simplistic. And it's interesting to put in more complexities and nuances in the problem reflecting the real world. Another interesting question is what incentive structures this leads to? So if you just use something like sample mean, that leads to incentives of inflating grades. What if we use such an estimator? And finally, more broadly, and there are important questions about evaluation metrics and methods to evaluate peer review. There is no ground truth in peer review. So how do you evaluate whether a certain policy is working well or not, whether some algorithms are working well or not. Those are interesting, important problems. So to conclude, we discussed fraud and feedback, two F words in peer review. We designed algorithms and evaluated them to address these. More generally in peer review, there are a number of open problems which are both theoretically exciting, they are important for practice and if you solve them, it can have real world impact. And I've written an overview of various computational problems and solutions uh, here. Um, and I've pasted a link on chat in case people are interested. With that, I'm very, very happy to answer more questions. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks, Nihar. That was an excellent talk. Well, let's thank Nihar if you could unmute and clap. Thank you. I'm very happy to answer more questions. And yes. Thank you for all the questions during the talk. These are great questions. Yes, I think I should stop hogging the bandwidth and let others ask questions. Hi, Nihal. Hey, go ahead. Thanks for the excellent talk. So I have a question. So is there a way to incorporate, uh, let's say, uh, a student's expected marks or an author's, let's say, expected number of papers yeah. to determine the partial ordering? Uh, for yeah. example, a student might end up getting uh, more marks than they expected. So it's possible that their bias may be less yeah. than another student with lower marks but with higher Perfect. expected marks, right? So yeah. it's fair way to incorporate that's, that. That's, that's a great question, right? So the question is, hey, you know, a student got a B, but maybe they were expecting a D, right? And they got a B, whereas there's another student who was expecting an A plus and got an A. So the first student who got a B might have a more positive bias. And that's a great point. And if there is a way to compute, to, to get a handle on these kinds of expected grades, then yes, you can incorporate them by considering the directionality in terms of the difference between the received and expected grades. I see. Right. And then you can apply the same thing. Um, of course, there's this question of how do you compute the expected grade? But if you can, then absolutely, yes. Yeah, right. great point. Makes sense, thanks. Any other question? Just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. And then I think we should wait for 10 more seconds. Okay, well, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, an excellent talk. I'll, I'll follow up with you and uh, uh, this is very, very interesting. A uh, bunch of uh, questions and also uh, some uh, conversations. It'll be great. Perfect. I look forward to it. Thank you so much again, Devrat. Thank you again. Let's uh, thank uh, Nihar again. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay. I hope to 